morning. Welcome, Trinity Church. My name is Gray. And I'm Pixie. And we are so excited to have y'all join us this morning in worship and Bible study in church service at your home. So we want to make sure that everyone in the family grabs their Bible and prepares their hearts and souls for worship. Um, also, later this week, we will be having the men's and the ladies' Bible study going over Nancy Guthrie's book. Uh, it will be in the email, the time and the day, uh, Monday nights for women. 7.30. And Thursday mornings at 7 a.m. for the men. And there will be a link for Zoom. So please join us there. And realize that we can't wait to see you again. And we are so sad that we haven't been able to see you in person yet, but we are excited when the day comes. God bless. Bless you all. Thank you. Good morning, I'm Noah Berner. And I'm Tiffany Berner, and it is our privilege to serve on the worship team here at Trinity. Now each week we begin service with a call to worship. And this is our response to the Lord as he calls us into his presence to worship him. So we invite you to hear these words from 2 Corinthians 9.8 and Ephesians 3.20-21. 2 Corinthians 9.8 And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. And Ephesians 3.20-21 Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Now please join us as we worship. For songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by flaming tongues above Praise the mount I'm fixed upon it Mount of thy redeeming love my Ebenezer hither by thy help I come and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home Jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of God he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood oh to grace how great a debtor daily i'm constrained to be let thy goodness like a fetter bind my wandering to thee prone to wander lord i feel it prone to leave the god i love here's my heart oh take and seal it seal it for thy courts above prone to wander lord i feel it prone to leave the god i love Here's my heart, oh, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it, seal it for thy courts above.
We now enter into a time of confession where we confess our sins corporately, and we do this to continue to enter into the Lord's presence with humility, acknowledging our sinful nature in light of God's mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Hear these words. Holy Spirit, breath of God and fire of love, I cannot pray without your aid. We confess how desperately we need you. Kindle in me the fire of your love and illumine me with your light, that with a steadfast will and holy thoughts I may approach the Father in spirit and in truth. Through Jesus Christ, my Lord, who reigns with you and the Father in eternal union. Amen. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest, and without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart, and Lord, I need Last week, we began our sermon series on the Sermon on the Mount, 
And this morning we're going to move into the first part of the sermon, which is the introduction. And the introduction runs from verses uh, 3 to 16, and they set up for us the virtues and the vocation of Christ's people, of a Christian disciple. So let's begin, and let's just let's review and look at the map so we can orient ourselves to where we are. So it begins and ends, introduction and conclusion. So the introduction focuses on our values and our vocation. That's the Beatitudes. That's the you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. And then it ends with a threefold warning and call to put its teaching into practice. And in the middle, there's three key sections. This is the training program. So it's almost like section one or module one or class one is focuses on our doctrinal life. And the key idea here is the authority of Jesus's word. You have the sevenfold, I say to you, whose word is authoritative for shaping how we think about life. And then the second major section is on our devotional life. It's about the authenticity of our spiritual life. And then the third major section is on our daily life. So here we see the, the virtues and vocation of the Christian. We see our character and our calling. And so we move into the Beatitudes, and if you're going to experience the life-changing power of the Beatitudes, there's three things you're going to have to do. You're going to have to see the picture that they paint. You're going to have to hear the, the music, hear the song they sing. And then you're going to have to walk the path they provide. So that's what we want to do this morning. We want to help you see the picture, hear the music, and walk the path. So first, let's begin. See the picture that they paint. So what the Beatitudes do is they paint for us a comprehensive picture of a beautiful life, of the life that Christ celebrates in his kingdom. Now, to set this up, let's travel throughout time and space, and let's look at some images of beauty from other kingdoms. So let's first tra travel back to medieval China, and let's look at this image, because this is an image, the beauty of small feet. So maybe you've heard of foot binding, or it's also called lotus feet. So it was a custom of uh, applying a tight binding to the feet of young girls to prevent them from further growth. So this first came to prominence during the five dynasties and 10 kingdom period in imperial, imperial China, 10th through the 11th centuries. And it originated among the upper class court dancers. But then in the Song dynasty, which is 960 to 1279, it spread to the rest of the culture. It went mainstream. And it became very popular as a means of demonstrating and displaying your status. So small foot in China, very similar to other cultures where things like small waist in Victorian England represented the, the height of female refinement. And so for families with marriageable daughters, um, foot size translated into a form of currency and a means of achieving upward mobility. So the most desirable bride possessed the golden lotus, which was a three-inch foot. Now, it was respectable if your foot was four inches, then that was called the silver lotus, and that was still respectable, but anything five inches or above was considered an iron lotus, and your prospects of marriage would be dim. So it's the beauty of a small foot. Now, let's go over and let's look at Japan at the same time frame and other uh, South Asian cultures. And one thing that became very popular then is black teeth. So this was primarily done to preserve the teeth in old age. So it had a practical function and uh, keep you from tooth decay. But it became a sign of maturity, a sign of beauty, and a sign of sophistication and civilization. See, a common belief was that uh, it was black teeth that marked you out from other animals. So like dogs have white teeth, but then it was beautiful and sophisticated to have black teeth. And it would also protect them. And you can still see this now in places like Vietnam, Philippines, Peru, Ecuador. Um, there's some remnants. So black teeth, 
sign of beauty. Or let's go over, let's, let's go over into Europe and look at Queen Elizabeth. So in the Elizabethan age, the beautiful Queen, Queen Elizabeth. And the signs of beauty in Elizabeth's age and in her kingdom are extremely pale white skin and then a high forehead. And see, some of us were just born in the wrong time because women would actually take and they would pluck the hairs on their forehead to get that nice, beautiful, high forehead. And then they would take this, this paste, uh, it's pastely, and they would take paste and put it on their, their, their face to achieve that, uh, that white complexion. See, in, in many cultures, the whiter the skin, the more beautiful is considered because it was a sign of being delicate or that you weren't, you didn't have to be out in the sun working until you're rich. And uh, now one interesting thing about that paste that Elizabeth would put on in the Elizabethan age, it was actually toxic. It would eat holes in your skin. So she, when she died, she actually had holes that had been eaten in her skin from the makeup. So those images of beauty, white skin, high forehead, and then you can cross the channel and probably the literal king of fashion is King Louis the 14th. And so he actually has been called the, the father of modern fashion. And for Louis, beauty was big. It was ornate. It was gaudy. And so if you have ever suffered through an evening in the most uncomfortable shoes imaginable, but you wore them because they were beautiful, they made the outfit, and you were just going to suffer for the shoes, you have Louis to thank for that. You're a child of Louis Fourteenth. Or if you go into your closet and it is overflowing with clothes, you have Louis to thank for that. See, he was the first one to ever promote the belief that you needed a separate or a different outfit for every occasion. And so every kingdom, every culture has its own images of beauty. These pictures of beauty that it projects out into the world. And sometimes from a distance, they can seem strange to us. Now, let's actually take a moment and I want you to pause for discussion. So hit pause and I want you to Think about a couple different things. Were any of these images strange to you? Do we have similar things? What would somebody look back in our world 500 years from now and say, oh, that is odd. They used to do what? What are some of the key images of beauty in our culture? What are you being trained to desire? See, we can think, oh, if I lived in, you know, if I lived in Japan, I wouldn't want my teeth black. Yes, you would have. If I lived in Elizabethan England, I wouldn't have put that stuff on my face. Yes, you would have. So we're being trained to desire something. But not only are we being trained to desire, we're developing disappointments if we don't attain. So for example, if you had a five-inch foot in the Song Dynasty of China as a woman, you would be disappointed in yourself. What are some other unrealistic realities that our culture is training you to be disappointed in yourself if you don't have. Take a moment and talk about that. Well, I hope you had some interesting discussion. And what we see in this passage is that the Beatitudes are going to give us a picture of beauty, a picture that we're meant to desire, but we have to be trained to desire it. See, initially, these things are going to seem very strange to us. So let's jump into the passage and see what we see. All right, let's come down and look at the text. So let's read through the Beatitudes. And as we do, we want to develop the habit and the skill of noticing. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. 
Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of false, all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So the first thing we want to do is we just want to notice what's here. The most important skill you can have when you're reading the Bible is the, just the ability to notice. Repeated words, structure, order. So the first thing is obvious. We see this word blessed over and over. Blessed. All these have the same structure. Blessed. So we're going to notice that. And we want to count them up. How many are there? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so there's nine of them. I really wish there was seven. Or if there was ten, that would be easier, but now we're wondering, why is there nine? Why are they structured this way? And next thing you notice, the first eight are all structured in a very similar pattern, and then this ninth one is very different. It's much longer. And we also notice that they all have the same basic structure. Blessed are, 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 blessed are, and then four, 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 so blessed are. So this is dealing with identity. It's who you are. And then there's a promise or a celebration. Blessed are the poor in spirit for. And then a promise comes. And then we notice that in the second half, there's a repetition, more repetition. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So what we see is this... This creates a frame. Technical word for that is an inclusio, where it frames. This is the beginning. This is the end. This is a, a verbal cue to let you know this is going to frame up the material. So why is the frame here and then this one's outside it? Then another thing we want to notice for they, 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 they. This is all third person. It's in the third person. Then here, there's a shift to the second person. Blessed are you. So it starts out in third person. So it begins with some distance. Then it's going to move into the second person, where it's going to get more personal. But what we want to look now is we're trying to unpack the structure. Because very often in the Bible, the meaning is embedded in the structure. And so there's a lot of different ways you could break this down. You could break it down as three groups of three, which, as you know, would appeal to me greatly. You could break it down as, um, some break it down as a group of seven, with this one just reiterating uh, the first one. But I think the way we're going to break it down, I think probably the simplest way, is to see these eight as the core Beatitudes, and then this one serves as a transition that's going to connect the Beatitudes to the next section, and so it's a transitional Beatitude, and so these eight are going to serve as the core, and what you'll notice, and what we'll do, the way we're going to unpack it over the next couple weeks, is these first four, these first four, notice they're primarily dealing with things internal. Poor in spirit, mourn, the meek, the hunger and thirst for righteousness. This is internal. And then when you come here, these, these next four, primarily dealing with the way you respond to or deal with others outside of you. You're merciful. Pure in heart could go either way, but you're a peacemaker. You're persecuted. So this is dealing with external relationships. So internal, external. So what we see here in the Beatitudes and what we're going to break down over the next couple of weeks is that they paint a picture for us. They paint a picture of, they paint a comprehensive portrait of the faithful Christian disciple, of a mature Christian. And what we see is we see first him or her alone before God, on their knees before God. We see the internal dispositions of a beautiful spirit. And those dispositions are, they're alone before God, they're acknowledging and aware of their own spiritual poverty, 
They mourn over their own sin. They've been given this vision of God and of themselves that makes them humble and it makes them meek. But that meekness is not a weakness. It's a profound and deep strength because now they're alive spiritually. And so they hunger and they thirst for righteousness. That's a beautiful picture of who they are on the inside. That's what the first four show us. And then the second four move them out into the world. We see him, we see her relating to others. What we do is we see them and they don't withdraw from the world. They're not insulating themselves from the world's pain. Like salt, they enter into the, 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 the death and the decaying and the dying and they're keeping it, they're preserving it, trying to keep it from getting worse. And what we see is they're right in the, in the thick of hard, difficult reality in life. We see them showing mercy to those who have been battered by sin. We see them and they're transparent and pure in all of their dealings with others. We see them and they're active in making peace. And yet, these efforts are often oppressed. They're vilified, they're slandered, they're insulted, but they don't respond in kind. And see, this is a beautiful picture of what the man or woman who is blessed by God looks like. What a picture of a beautiful people. But this picture is upside down. It's backwards from how we normally think. And I think it's really important to see that these aren't eight um, separate or discrete aspects of, of spiritual beauty. They're like the fruit, the fruit singular of the Spirit, where we are intended to demonstrate and display all of them. So it's a picture of someone who's both meek and merciful, poor and pure, a peacemaker and persecuted, mourning and hungry. This is true beauty. This is real spirituality. Do you see it? Do you desire it? The first thing we need the Beatitudes to do for us is to paint a picture of real spiritual beauty. All right, now the second thing we need to do if we're going to experience the power of the Beatitudes is we need to hear the music, hear the song they sing. So this is a song, a song of allegiance, a song of defiance, a song of hope. Now, in order to set this point up, let me actually show you a video clip from one of the most famous movies ever made, but possibly a video clip from a movie that many of you probably have never seen. So this is from a scene from the movie Casablanca, and it's widely regarded as one of the best movies ever. Um, you know, maybe you've heard the, here's looking at you, kid. And uh, the scene we're going to show, so let me set it up. So this scene that you're about to see marks a major, major turning point in the film. So right before this, the owner of the bar, uh, Humphrey Bogart, refuses to give and sell the letters of transit to from the war hero, uh, Victor, and his refusal, despite his careful attempts at framing it as simple neutrality, is actually a victory for the Nazis who are occupying Casablanca. And this moment, when they start singing this song, everything changes. And the song they sing, the song they're singing, you might not recognize it, it's the French national anthem. And from this point on, the uneasy stalemate between the appeasers and the Nazis can no longer continue. So let's watch the scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
their defiance, their protest, it all begins with this anthem. You have the Germans triumphantly singing their song of victory and rubbing it in the noses and the faces of all of the French. And then the rest of the bar is largely made up of refugees from the German war machine. And this anthem that the Germans are singing feels like they're, they're taunting them. It's a callous display of their power over the people. And then they sing their own anthem, their own song of defiance their own song of allegiance, their own song of hope. And that's exactly what the Beatitudes are for us. Song of defiance, song of allegiance, song of hope. Let's look at them. Now, I want us to look at the Greek text. And don't worry, no one will get harmed. There is no Greek knowledge needed to be able to see this. But what I want you to see is just by looking at it, you'll be able to see the poetic nature of the text. Of course, here's our famous word for blessed. Got it all same rhythm and structure as the other one. You can see all nine. But notice how... Let's see, we'll get some green so you can see the ending. Notice the endings. Oi, 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 oi. And so there's these endings. Now, if you think I butcher English with my pronunciation, I positively slaughter other languages, so I'm not going to try and pronounce these things for you. What I want you to see is that, that, is that this is a poem. It's poetic. Notice this is the letter P, and these first four all start with the same letter P. See, P, 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 P. It's intended to be memorized. And then often the balancing phrase often will mirror that. So P, 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 see it here? And then you can also see same letters in parallel, same sense, L, L, Ka, Ka. Um, we got D, 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 Ka. See, all these different alliterations are intended, are poetic. So this is a poem, it's music. It's meant to be sung. And now let's bring the English back in and see a couple more things. So it's poetic. It's meant to be sung. But notice the shift for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Theirs is. This is about what is. And then notice in the middle, it's they shall be shall inherit, shall be satisfied, shall receive, shall see, shall see. See, the frame is about present tense reality, what is. But the whole middle is all about what will be. This is like a giant hope sandwich. Ah, a hope hoagie. This is the bread. What is is the bread. And then in the middle, it's shall, 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 shall. It's all about hope. So what I want you to see here is that this is a song. It's meant to be sung, but it's a song that is a song of defiance, and then it's a song of hope, a song of triumph. So you see, this was meant to be a song that you sing, and it's meant to get into you. I mean, this is Jesus' revolution song. This is his song that his kingdom is coming, and he's flipping everything upside down. And he's singing a song that celebrates all the things that the world tells us we should shun. We should be actively seeking riches and to be assertive and powerful and self-exalting and self-asserting. And this is a song that flips that on its head and sings the exact opposite. It's a song of gentleness and humility and grace and unassuming and simple faith. Jesus is turning upside down our definitions of the things that we want and desire and what we see as beautiful and the songs that we sing about heroes and hope and dreams and desires. See, this is a song that's meant to shape your ambitions about who you want to become. But it's also a song of hope. It's a hope hoagie. It's a picture of future blessedness. And see, so many areas of life we want instant. We want immediate. We want a perfect marriage. We want perfect kids. We want perfect health. We want perfect teeth, whether they're white or black. And we want it now. Immediate satisfaction, immediate gratification. But there is no instant holiness. This is a song of hope that's meant to orient you towards what he shall do, 
what you will experience. It orients you to our future hope. And the beauty and the power of the Christian hope is no matter who you are, where you are, our best days are always coming. They shall come. Your best days are always before you. So we don't have to cave into um, or suffer under the song of our culture that sings, uh, sings the song that our best days are the days of youth, the days of prosperity, the days when the sun is shining and everything is going well. We sing another song. Our best days are always ahead. So you don't have to fear sickness. You don't have to fear death. You don't have to fear loss. You don't have to fear aging. Your best days were not in high school or college or some other time with less responsibilities and in different situations or places. If you're a Christian, the Beatitudes teach us that. They teach us to sing a song of hope. And our best days are always coming. So if they're going to have their power, you have to see the picture they paint. And you have to sing the song they sing. But then you also have to walk the path they provide. See, the Beatitudes actually are a path. They're a stepping stone. They're a sequential movement into the presence of the Lord. See, they are descriptions of our character, but they're so much more than that. They're personal virtues, yes, but they're also a vocation. See, these are dispositions in how we can engage with the Word so we can experience the Lord. These actually provide a pathway into His presence. And so this is something that um, was very popular in teaching the Beatitudes. They were songs meant to memorize. And so in the early church, like Augustine and Gregory of Nyssa would encourage people to memorize these and, and view these as a ladder of ascent up into the presence of the Lord. And this tradition continued through people like Thomas Aquinas, even all the way up to Spurgeon and Martin Lloyd-Jones in the 20th century, would teach people that this is a pathway into the presence of the Lord. So let's actually, let's look at this, this chart to show you how the, they're a pathway that move you into his presence. So we can think about the Beatitudes like ascending a mountain. If you want to enter into the Lord's presence, you ascend up the mountain, and it must begin with humility, the poor in spirit. We humble ourselves before the Lord and before his word, and then that leads to a certain knowledge, and it leaves us to mourn. We mourn for the loss of the ultimate good, for who we were created to be, for what has been lost when we fell and how far short of the divine ideal we come, and we mourn for the brokenness of both ourselves and our world. And then that creates the key disposition for interpreting the scriptures. Meekness. We're gentle. We're open. And then that produces a hunger where we hunger and thirst for his righteousness. And then we become reliant on divine mercy, which involves receiving mercy, but then also being merciful to ourselves. And then that leads to a purification of heart and intellect. And then we enter into the presence of the Lord. This is the ultimate. We see God. We come into his presence and see him. And then flowing out of that vision and that sight, we then go into the world and we become peacemakers. And we're called sons of God. But just like his son, we go out into the world and in the world we often are persecuted for righteousness sake. And then we experience what he experienced. He was reviled and persecuted and all types of evil was said against him. But even so, we rejoice and are glad. So the Beatitudes provide us so much. They're a description of our character. They're a description of the personal virtues that the Lord wants to cultivate in us. But they're also dispositions about how we engage with the Word and how we can experience the Lord. And they're attitudes. They are our are. You are, you are, you are. These are habits of the heart, the lifestyle of the righteous, the path we're supposed to walk. You know, maybe your days are filled with to-do lists, things you're supposed to do. But have you ever thought about your to-be list? The Sermon on the Mount gives us both. The Beatitudes set the stage and the introduction, 
verses 3 through 16 set the stage for this is who we're meant to be. And then the rest of the sermon will key in on things we're meant to do. But this is our to be list. So now the question is, how can we be this way? And that's what we'll take up over the next couple weeks. But a couple things just kind of help frame how we think about this. This is a call to experience blessedness. Living under the smile of the Lord where you experience full human flourishing. And as we think about what the blessed life is, it's really important to always remember that the world and we began in a state of blessedness. The Lord looked at the world and it was good. And he blessed it. And he said, be fruitful and multiply. We were not meant to be futile. We were not meant to struggle and suffer in sorrow. We were meant for the blessed life to flourish and to fill. But then because of sin, it was lost. And one of the great themes of the whole Bible is how do we get that back again? That's the theme of the Pentateuch, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy, where we can enter back into the, the blessing of the Lord, where the high priest, in, in, as the representative of the Lord, stands over the people and puts his name on them by blessing them and say, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. And then that's one of the key themes runs all throughout the Psalms. How can we experience what it means to be blessed so we can be like a tree planted by streams of water so we can flourish in every season? So the question is, how do we get this back? And one of the things Jesus is doing here is describing the type of people that the Lord has blessed. Who are the people who experience his face shining upon them? And so he's setting for us a whole different set of attitudes a whole different scale of values, painting for us a different picture about what a beautiful person looks like, who our heroes should be. So this is a call to be shaped by who we actually are. See, repentance in chapter 4, he's preached. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Repentance is the gateway in. And then from here, this is how we're shaped by repentance. This is a picture of the kind of people we want to be like. And Jesus is turning upside down what our definition of a hero is, what um, we should dream about and desire, the type of people we should set our ambitions on becoming. But a key thing here is that if we really want to see the beautiful picture, we need to first look at him. See, he's the full embodiment of all of these things. He's both our model and our redeemer. See, before these can ever be a picture of you, they're a picture of Him. So this actually is a picture of our Redeemer that we should praise. This song that He teaches us to sing is His song. It's a song of His revolution. It's a song of allegiance to Him. And the path that He calls us to walk is a path that He's walked before us. So you can look back through the text and see all of the promises, the song of hope, what you shall experience. You shall be filled and comfort. And all of these things are gifts that he promises to us because he has already purchased them for us. By his death and resurrection, he purchased these things. And now through his spirit, his word, his church, he provides them to us. So a few key things to think about. This is character before it's conduct. This is who we're meant to be. This is a portrait of all Christians, not just the exceptional ones. And we're all meant to manifest them all. So now let's pause and take a moment and just think, all right, how can this be true of us? So here's a few questions to discuss with either just yourself, you can write them down in a journal, or whoever you're watching this with. So here's a couple questions. These are meant to be the primary attitudes that shape Jesus' followers. What attitudes do you think people normally think of when they think of Christians? Do they think of these? And then, what would the world be like if more people were this way? And then third, if these are the dispositions, the habits, the attitudes of real Christians, do you have them? And then how can you get them?
Now pause and take a few moments to pray that the Beatitudes would become a living reality in your life and in the life of those you love and in our church. Now let's pray for inner renewal through the word. Gracious God and most merciful Father, you have granted us the rich and precious jewel of your holy word. Assist us with your spirit, that the same word may be written in our hearts to our everlasting comfort, to reform us, to renew us according to your own image, to build us up and edify us into the perfect dwelling place of your Christ sanctifying and increasing in us all heavenly virtues. Grant this, O Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Praise Him, all creatures. 
creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. And now may the love of a dying Savior, the power of a risen Savior, and the hope of a returning Savior be yours this day, this week, now, and always. Stay in peace. <laughs>